Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to another Queensland branch of the Australian Institute of International Affairs seminar webinar. We're both here at Holding Redlick, our sponsors in Brisbane and online over the web. Uh, my name is Paul Lucas. I'm the Queensland branch president of the AIA, and I'm delighted to have Ian Kemish, adjunct professor Ian Kemish AM, as our guest tonight. Uh, Ian is going to talk. Uh, Ian's had a wonderful career in diplomacy, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Uh, but he's going to talk, you know, from the point of view of the highs and the lows. Uh, if you're looking at a career in diplomacy, what are the sorts of things that uh, motivate uh, DFAT and those people who are selecting them? What do the what what, what happen, Who does what in diplomacy? What what's a desk? Uh, what's a, what happens in an embassy? Uh, how do they work? Those sorts of issues. So Ian's going to tell us all of those tonight, and um, you can ask him plenty of questions as well uh, from uh, 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 from his career. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about Ian. Uh, Ian is a former senior Australian diplomat with interest and expertise in the history of Southeast Asia and the Pacific and in Australia's engagement with those reason, the regions. He originally graduated with honours in modern Southeast Asian history from the University of Queensland. His government career included service as High Commissioner to Papua New Guinea, Ambassador to Germany, Head of the Prime Minister's International Division uh, and DFAT's Southeast Asia Division. He was awarded membership of the Order of Australia for his role as Chair of the Government's International Emergency Task Force in leading the response to the 2002 Bali bombings. He moved to the private sector in 2013, supporting companies to improve their sustainability and community development outcomes in the Indo Pacific. Uh, this includes the adoption of new greenhouse gas emissions targets and biodiversity objectives by leading ASX companies. He received a UQ Alumni Excellence Award in 2014, and as I indicated, he's, a, uh, uh, he's an adjunct professor at the University of Queensland. Uh, welcome, Ian. Great to be with you, Paul. Thanks for the invitation again. Um, yes, we've we been well, Obviously, a good recommendation for that. Uh, Ian, a, a great career, an illustrious career um, in diplomacy, marked with many events, uh, some very auspicious, some tragedies. Um, why did you go to diplomacy in the first place? What, what were your influences? Were family influences? Why? What, what made you think about this as a career? Thanks, Paul. I, um, I grew up in a family that did not really prize uh, the idea of you know, owning a home and um, material possessions. My, my, my parents moved around quite a bit. They were always drawn by the romance of the, you know, other countries. So, they met each other in Nigeria. Um, they're both Brits. Uh, they met each other in Nigeria. He was with the army. She was with. She was a secretary, you know, working for the Nigerian government. And, you know, that spirit led them to emigrate to Australia and then go to Papua New Guinea, where I grew up. But they spent more money on on holidays on holidays than they ever spent on uh, on uh, on a house. I think my parents first bought bought a home when they were in their late fifties, actually. Uh, and uh, so I was pretty comfortable in the international world, um, I suppose, looking back. I don't think I realised that at the time, but I, I suppose I was. Shoot forward to my university years, and I have to be really frank about this, and perhaps it's instructive for some younger people. I uh, wasn't clear about what I wanted to do to begin with. wasn't entirely sure, didn't really understand what my options were. I had a real interest in, you know, in the history of diplomacy. When I think about it, the, the subject that drew me uh, in my first pass of my degree, my undergraduate degree, were things like the history of the Cold War, you know, great power diplomacy. Liked all that. Like some young men of then and now, I suspect, the switch didn't really get turned on until I was a bit later in my 20s. So I drifted into teaching for a while suddenly refocused, began to understand my options, returned to university, turned it into a you know, strong uh, degree in Southeast Asian political history. You know, I had to do an honours year on top of what I'd already done. So you've previously done the arts degree? I've done, I've done a very straightforward arts degree in, in English and history. Um, went off, taught a bit, travelled a bit, drove a, drove a, a, a delivery van in London, um, uh, and... Uh, 
traveled a lot in Southeast Asia. And slowly but surely, by my mid 20s, I was quite clear about what I wanted to do. I went back, reconstructed that degree, applied for foreign affairs, and was successful. Um, it's, and, you know, I think that combination of having a good and relevant degree and uh, having lived a bit was attractive to the organisation. And I do know that that's one thing that remains the case. Feedback. It's sort of funny in my old game of politics. You know, I often say to people, I learn more about the law and more about politics in the drive-in bottle shop and the public bar of the Balmoral Hotel than ever in the university. And are you, is, is that what you were saying? That in many respects, the rounded nature of your um, experiences uh, was a real factor, you think, in, in your attractiveness to DFA? I think so. Um, I just want to say, though, before I go any further, I happen to be talking in front of a, of a fellow member of my intake. She looks younger than I am, because, that's because she is. But Sally Moonen over there um, uh, joined the organisation the same year as me. There's an interesting point there, though. Um, so there were, I think there were 25 of us who had been recruited that year by the Department of Foreign Affairs. And then there were about eight, about eight recruited by the Department of Trade, of which Sally was one. Uh, and we, it was the year we merged, and we were slammed <laughs> together, weren't we? Uh, it, it kind of worked out, worked out quite well. Um, I think there was a bit of a habit with trade and with other organisations to focus a bit more. I think I'm right about this uh, on the on on the academic. This is how you get somebody who joined. I mean, Sally was at least five years. Let's say at least five years younger than I, <laughs> that, that I was at the at the time. And I think. The foreign affairs types, and this is true of DFAT graduates today, probably were a bit older on average and had lived a bit more. And so is that, and that's still the case? So, so, so can you just, just tell us how today, um, I, I suspect they don't want 60 year olds, but uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll just put my cue back in the rack. But um, the what's a typical DFAT applicant these days? <laughs> you know, well, funny you should mention because today I have been reviewing um, uh, as kind of mentor and to one and as a favour to the other um, applications by two individuals to join DFAT on the current rack. Um, one of them is a young woman who's been working for me for my consultancy business uh, um, as an analyst and, and advisor and is, and is a an international relations graduate, but over the last year or so, she's been living in Mexico, uh, the West Bank, and traveling in Africa. She's been working with NGOs. Um, she continued to work for me no matter where, where she is. She's currently in Mexico City. Her partner is the other one. <laughs> they're, both, they're, they're both applying. And he too. Well, either you get one right or you get one wrong. <laughs> That's right. Uh, he, he too is, you know, a little bit similar, a different kind of degree. Uh, they're both from the state of Victoria in this in this case, and they have international relations backgrounds. That's not actually a requirement, by the way. They, these two just happen to have that, and they have worked a bit. They're, they're now in their mid twenties. They've worked a bit in the international space, and they they feel like they're ready to try and join the government. Did you have a foreign language when you uh, when you joined DFAT? Uh, yeah, I did, but I, I wasn't. I, I wouldn't. You wouldn't have put me in the linguist category at that time, and that's not actually by any means a requirement. Um, let me put it this way: there, there, people offer a package to DFAT, and the package differs from one to the other. There are, by all means, people who have a whole bunch of foreign languages as as part of the package they offer. And in the case of these two young people I'm talking about, Daniela is her name, has five languages. She, she's, she's quite a gun on, on, on languages. That's actually unusual. Um, uh, in my case, I had straightforward Indonesian at the time, uh, university second year French, which kind of doesn't really count to be really honest with you. Um, it, 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 it doesn't get you near fluency. And I'd grown up in Papua New Guinea, so I had Bob Bisson. Um, but honestly, I did not think of myself as a linguist, and that wasn't part of my profile. 
I've actually gifted deep out. I've actually learnt other languages and taken them to much, much higher levels of proficiency within the system. So I now speak, you know, I, I claim to speak so German and Indonesian fluently these days, but that's not the case when I join. It's about the package and the package can differ. Very briefly, just bear in mind that in my view, one of the most successful heads of department that DFAT's ever, ever had, some would argue with this, uh, the bloke called Ashton McCallard, who was a mathematician. So, you know, the package differs. Let's develop that point um, a little bit. Um, when I think of what Australia was like when I was a young person, and I think of what it's like now, um, I think one of the things I'm most proud about this country is 29% of this population was born overseas. And 50% and of this country have one parent born overseas. Uh, that is a tremendous strength of this country. We're a bit of everything, uh, and uh, that can be, you know, to an enormous advantage uh, because people who work in our, for, for DFAT and organisations like it don't come from just your standard white Anglo-Celtic Anglo background, they bring all of the cultural experiences that they have from their old country and their new country. The ability to explain or put a foot on both sides. You know what that point a bit of it. Are we, are we in a way, you know, and is it fair for us to take advantage? Are we bludging a bit with poor language in our schools? Um, we don't care it's an, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because we often say to say in a... Uh, self-deprecating way as, as Australians that, that, you know, we're not good at languages, that um, uh, that we're outclassed by others, that we're very monolingual and, and all the rest of it. We need to be careful when we say that because we're actually not speaking for all of us. <laughs> the, 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 uh, um, there is indeed a very significant uh, community of people in Australia who speak different, lots of different languages. And I was mentioning to Paul just before this, um, as head of mission in Berlin, I was also accredited as a math of Switzerland. And, uh, you know, it was actually a more, probably a more serious economic relationship than you might imagine. And uh, I uh, remember early on in my time in that role, sitting down and talking to a senior person at UBS, the, you know, the major Swiss uh, financial institution. And he was telling not, me, not Credit Suisse. Not Credit Suisse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fortunately, it was right there. It was UBS. Right. And, and he, he was at pains to, to explain to me that he had just made a decision to locate uh, their global IT support um, centre in Sydney because that was the place where you could get all the languages you needed locally to run a global operation interesting way and it's a surprising way for some of us about thinking about Australia but we're a bit too speed on this I won't, I won't use your language and say that some of us are bludging on the others but we just be, need to be careful who we're speaking for well and I, and I think it's a country when you look you know you, you learn Indonesian though and the, you know the country that I'm also very passionate about very few schools now now teach Indonesian in schools and I think that is terrible and I think you know in that context uh, governments uh, are not providing the funding uh, for enough Asian languages, enough overseas languages. Yeah, might serve that budget. Um, so, uh, can I ask you about? You know, I've been referee, and you get the telephone call from the security people when you're a referee for someone when they're going for a job at DFAT and the like, and they ask you everything on the under the sun about you know what's the extreme views on this, that, and the other thing. Um, it sort of struck me that. Uh, they, they, they look for people who can see all sides of arguments rather than being dogmatic on a particular point of view. I mean, what is, what is the ideal, uh, you know, when you've got a third secretary walk into you and you're the ambassador, you don't expect them to, you know, well, you better be doing this. It's, you know, what, what are you, an early career diplomat, what are, what are the skill sets that you're looking for? Here? Well, it's a really interesting question. Um, I don't need my third secretary uh, um, or indeed anybody on my staff to be a genius. I need I need to be smart. Don't get me <laughs> don't get don't get me wrong. But I don't need them to be a genius. Indeed, if one if one gets posted to my embassy, I'm just imagining myself at the post, and I know that one of them's got a doctorate, I'll be slightly suspicious of that person because I want to be convinced that that person has 
you know, I'm, make, I'm making a light point, it's not terribly serious, point, but I, I want to be convinced that person not only has strong academic credentials, but also has an ability to engage uh, and to and to deal with people. And I, I, I think that's terribly important. I think that um, people come in all shapes and sizes in all sorts of different packages. And I have been guilty of underestimating people closer to my embassies and realising just how much potential they had over, over time. And, and it's interesting, I, I suppose, when you talk to, you know, for example, our former counsellor, a, a great al analyst working for defence, but in Indonesia, Greta Naps Keller. So much of the of the material you work with is open source material. It's not all this funny stuff. It's about observing what's happening and digesting that. And here are the various sides of the arguments. Uh, you know, because it's a bit like doing a math sum, isn't it? You've got to show you're working. You don't say to the minister, here's the answer. You know, they'll need to understand those points. We, we, we used to talk more than we do now, and I think this will come back over time. We used to talk more than we do now about DFAT as an intelligence organisation. Um, uh, because so much of the information and intelligence that come, is available to government doesn't actually come from the spies. It, it, it actually comes from people who are going out there and having open conversations and learning things out there transparently, making judgments about it, applying their analytical skills and then serving it up in a way that says this is why it's important to Australia and this is why you need to know about it. Um, and so, you know, I, to me, the perfect diplomat has the ability to get out there, talk to people for information to come to, come to them, not in a sneaky way, but just to be able to engage and um, to be able to influence and project Australia's view, so all that interpersonal stuff, but also an ability to turn around and deal right up the line with your own system and uh, advocate for what's important. Because in the end, public servants have to believe in democracy. They have to serve the government of the day. And you know, no one elected them, so that's what they have to do. Uh, um, but you have this huge opportunity at different places in the system to influence. And the influencing within is as important as influencing out. Let's go back to basics a bit and some, um, some terminology. So um, what's an ambassador do? Or, uh, what do councillors do? What do uh, first secretaries, second, se second secretaries, third secretaries? I don't know if there is a fourth secretary, is it? No, I don't know. Um, uh, if you're getting kicked out, probably you become a fourth secretary. Uh, so what are, they, what are they all doing? What's the different roles there? So these are traditional, um, internationally recognised diplomatic ranks within the system. They all have their Australian public service grade equivalent. So, you know, people know what they're going to go back to if they go back to Canberra as an equivalence level all the way up through the system. But those diplomatic ranks, I mean, you know, yeah, a, a third secretary is somebody who is uh, generally on their first posting, um, uh, learning the ropes a bit. They've already done a bit of training there. And, um, you know, I, I, I was at that level in a little Southeast Asian post called Brunei, oh. and it was a fantastic learning experience. Um, uh, I may have been a very junior person, but it was such a small mission that when the boss went away, I got to run the show. And so I got to be acting high commissioner half of my, half, half of my time, or a quarter of my time. So third secretary, second, first secretary, these are just sort of levels within the system. Sometimes you can go off on posting as a third secretary, means you get yourself promoted a couple of times, and by the time you finish, you're a first secretary. But, you know, the, the, those are the sort of the, the, the more junior managerial levels. There's a level called councillor above that, um, uh, and at that level, you know, you can, you could be a senior ish person in a big mission, be it an embassy or a high commission. I'll come back to the difference between them in a minute. Um, the, uh, but also at that rank, and this is how it also works, that person who might be a counselor <laughs> and somebody who is, um, I don't know, third from the top in Jakarta or Port Moresby or Washington, one of these, one of these big places could also be an ambassador or a high commissioner somewhere else in a smaller place. So, you know, the, the, um, 
uh, the heads of mission in, it doesn't have to be Kiribati, which is terribly small, it can also be Portugal or somewhere like that. That person could easily finish their posting as ambassador there and then go be a counsellor at a big mission, you know. So the council is another level. There actually is another one called Minister Counselor, which you only get on big missions, but and then you get the boss. And the boss is an ambassador or a high commissioner, depending on whether it's two Commonwealth countries or not. And that's the only difference if anyone's confused. When one one country has representation, one Commonwealth country has representation to another Commonwealth country, they exchange high commissions. And formally speaking, as High Commissioner, you represent your government, not your head of state. Formal. Doesn't make any bloody difference. And then the and then um, if one or, or both are not members of the Commonwealth, then an ambassador. So I was an ambassador in Germany, not a member of the Commonwealth, and I was a High Commissioner in Papua New Guinea. Effectively the same job. Hmm. Trivia question. Does anyone know what court you're accredited to if you're uh, uh, accredited to uh, uh, the United Kingdom of uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland? Court of St James. Court of St James, that's right. Um, and depending on whether you're a High Commissioner or an Ambassador or representing a realm, de de determines how many horses you get on the carriage that, that take you to Buckingham's Palace for your accreditation, I understand. I've never had that role. Oh, right. my, my friend who was German Ambassador to, uh, to, to the Court of St James also had the keys of the city bestowed on him, which meant theoretically that he could drive a flock of sheep across the <laughs> <and blue. laughs> He always told me he was looking forward to this moment. <laughs> <laughs> As the transport minister, I got to drive a, a tram in Stuttgart once. So, um, uh, and what about um, consul generals and, and, and consular duties? They're part of the diplomatic corps, but how do they sit? Are they under the direction of the ambassador? Sure. How, what do they do? Yeah, uh, it's so, you know, uh, that's, what, book, that's what this book's about. <laughs> the, the, uh, with, with many of you are familiar with, I know, thank you for the support. Um, this is a stream of work within the organisation, which is all about responding to Australians in difficulty overseas. That's what it is. And the people who do this work, um, if they're junior in the system, are called consuls. They're actually, they actually have second, third secretary ranks as well, but let's not confuse things. They're called consuls. And if they're a big, serious one, um, uh, senior in a senior position, they, they may be called consul general. The extra little, if you, if, you, if you really want to just complete the picture, posts that are not in capital cities tend to get called, be called consulates or consulate general. So um, other countries have consulates or consulates general, depending on their size in Sydney, whereas they have embassies in Canberra. Um, in uh, India, Australia has a, has a high commission in New Delhi, but it has a consulate general in Mumbai and various other places too. But that's uh, the post in New Caledonia is called a consulate general because actually the capital is Paris. Well, and, and, and well, what about in Taiwan? We don't have an ambassador to Taiwan, do we? No, we call that a representative office. <laughs> <laughs> we call it something completely different. <laughs> we don't go. We don't. Think about anything yeah. diplomatic in, in that case. <laughs> so, um, just tell me about an embassy. Um, when you go into an embassy, um, you know you've got to put your, you know, your hand, show them your passport. You put the mobile phone in the in the drawer and all of that sort of stuff. You have Australian staff and you have locally retained staff. Yeah. Just explain why there's different sort of staff. Explain some of the security issues that exist in, in, in embassies and why. Well, in the end, you know, the embassy, let's call it embassy as a generic term, um, is a place uh, where sensitive information is stored. Um, uh, it uh, And where conversations between representatives of a foreign nation on, you know, the soil of another country need to take place in a way that is protected. Um, for us to, as a, as a government, to get, you know, an unfettered, clear view from our diplomats overseas and for them to be able to operate effectively, the information they 
have and the conversations they have need to be protected. Not everything in the embassy needs to be classified. There's lots of work, lots and lots and lots of work that doesn't of, a, of uh, an ad, not only of an administrative and, and consular nature. And not one of these missions would work effectively if it were not for the extraordinary work that's done by locally engaged staff. There are people, there are heroes among them, people who have um, uh, done extraordinary things for Australia and have been recognised, not enough of them, uh, with honorary awards of Australia. I think, for example, I do mention this in my book of the uh, driver at the embassy in Tokyo who refused to leave the Fukushima radioactive zone and continued to drive and support staff as the consular effort un unrolled uh, over, t over time. Um, extraordinary contribution. And, you know, I think, I, I, I think about Berlin and how I finally realised that having a German executive assistant made me so much more powerful. Yeah, there were some issues because as a German, she couldn't have access to everything that was in the, in, in the room. So I had to manage that. But honestly, if the Prime Minister of Australia, and his name was Kevin Rudd at the time, wanted to speak to the, the Chancellor, and he wanted to a lot, um, uh, you know, Claudio, my EA, had a very good relationship with Merkel's EA. I hardly had to do anything. It just happened. And it doesn't happen so easily when, when you've got an Australian well, just explain then, you know, and, and, and what sort of, you know, there's rooms you can talk in and rooms you can't talk in. There's documents they call osteo and, I mean, not, and, you know, what, what's all that about? Well, there are, there, there, are, there, there are a series of national security classifications which, you know, go from unclassified to top secret. And then there's a whole lot of code names that go with, that, that, meet, that talk about particular handing. Osteo means Australian eyes only. In other words, no one else is supposed to see it um, uh, unless they're cleared Australian officers. Uh, and so, top secret osteo would be that's about as big as it gets. There's some other stuff that I'm probably not supposed to talk about, but it, but, it, 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 but that, that's that, that's quite serious. Um, the uh, so you know there's there's and you know it goes up through. It's still the same. It, it's it's unclass restricted. Confidential, secret, top secret are the are the bands, and you've got to make a judgment about you know whether what you're writing about uh, has that degree of sensitivity. And when you get right to the top, it's usually about the sources that you're trying to protect. So, so you know, other, people from other countries can get Australian clearances, but not. For reasons you understand, the a national of the country that you're at the inn would be terribly conflicted if they were asked to walk both sides of that divide. So that's that's out. That doesn't work. I certainly remember in my twenties in the army reserve, uh, and uh, I was uh, for my you know, for other people's sins. I was a cook, and uh, <laughs> Australian Army Catering Corps Pam One, which was the basic cookbook, had on the front of it. Before, uh, uh, this uh, official use only. Mm -hmm. This document is not to be communicated to the press or anyone not, not authorised to to receive it. So I'm wondering why. <laughs> 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 classification, but you know, yeah. right after the Cold War. Uh, the uh, uh, but you do you do assume, don't you, when you're having conversations? Uh, and what's the chance already, by the way? Um, uh, it's it's chancery. Yeah, chancery. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, not the chancery. The somewhere else. Uh, the uh, uh, that, um, that there are places where you can have certain conversations and places where you can't, because you do assume that an embassy is not secured uh, in many parts. Yeah, the term chancery, we, we, uh, it's, I, I would still use it. Uh, I think, um, I'm not sure the latest generation of diplomats would still use the term much, but the, in fact, the embassy is is a concept, right? The, emb the embassy is both the place where people work where the, and, and where the ambassador resides. Um, the chancery is distinguished very clearly. The office, the building, <laughs> where, you know, where the ambassador's office is. Uh, that's, that's essentially what the chancery is. Um, like I say, we, I would still use the term, not everybody still would. 
Um, but sorry, what was the rest of your question? Oh, just you would presume that rooms are secure. Like you, you, you don't go having any sort of conversation with the ambassador, uh, you know, in the in any part of the building. Uh, that you know, I'm just trying to re remember what was that the uh, uh, you know you hear about embassies being built in Moscow, and uh, you know they're almost falling down because they're full of bugs and not much concrete. Um, <laughs> and, and it's yeah, and then look, certain locations have, you have to worry about these things more than more than others, obviously. And Moscow is one, Beijing is another. Uh, they're not the only the only places. Um, and look, you know, we are all here, aren't we, today of the threats of cyber security. We've seen mm. it, it, it takes a very different form now to the form that it took when Sally and I first had our security briefings in, in DFAT. Although those security briefings were um, serious and opened our eyes up a little bit to how devices such as this, although devices such as this didn't exist then, but a few years later they did, devices such as this can be used could even then, in the, I'm thinking the late 90s, early 2000s, be used by others. So, you know, some traditionalists would be affronted, you know, foreign ambassador coming to call on you in your office would be affronted by being asked to leave your phone at the door and, 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 and lock up. But it's got nothing to do with what, whether that person might mm. use the phone in a certain way. It's about how others, these things can be activated, whether they're, whether they're turned off or not. Um, it's uh, uh, it's very very easy. So yeah, uh, there is a there's a restricted area. There are usually a couple of restricted areas or one restricted area within an embassy where you can't bring your phone in. It tends to be where the politi political branch works and where the ambassador works. Sometimes the ambassador is in the same location, so it's just one one section like that. But sometimes it's two. Uh, whereas the rest of it is. You know, as secure as you know, holding refugees. It's a uh, similar, similar arrangements. Um, the just uh, just to pivot a little bit. Um, uh, you were a high commissioner, Australian ambassador in a number of countries. Um, I won't ask you to talk about yourself in this regard, but what 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 were the some of the really great things or that you observed in fact, Australian or not? In, in, in um, ambassadors, uh, the great skills and qualities, some examples if you like, and also perhaps ones where people would simply, you know, you'd say, why would they do that? What yeah. are some of the qualities you observe positively and negatively? I can think of other, other great examples from other countries, but I will actually just, it probably makes more sense to talk about Australian examples. Um, look, you know, we grew up, um, under the shadow of a group of people who they called the 1969ers in the, in, in, in the Australian system. These were the people who were mainly blokes, it has to be said. Um, they were kind of like the Rolling Stones of our, our period. They just, people, all the people who seemed to refuse to get off the stage. <laughs> people who party hard. No, people, people who were running, running Canberra, um, who certainly in my latter years were heads of agency. I'm thinking about people like Dennis Richardson, recently retired, what, you know, head of, head of DFA and Defence, Rick Smith, who was in, um, in Jakarta and Beijing, and head of Defence as well, uh, ultimately. Uh, Michael Thorley, who was ambassador in, in Washington. These were people who um, were a bit different to the diplomats of today. They, they were, there were some really good things about them. They, they, they had the courage of conviction and would speak very clearly to power and express their views, and they could be very, very influential with, with government. I watched, when I was head of international and prime minister's department, I watched Thorley, who was then product of Church of England Grammar School here in, here in Brisbane, a um, generation older than me, I watched him shape Australian foreign policy from Washington with letters, faxes, phone calls to the lodge. I mean, that's, 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 that's how he managed it. He, yeah, he did the right thing and let everybody else know what he was doing, but he was in a position to communicate directly with the head of government about some pretty big issues at the time, uh, including, you know, our, our, our mission in Iraq, whatever you think of that, doesn't really matter for the purposes of the example. These, and it might surprise people, but I would emphasize an ability to influence one's own government has actually been terribly important. 
You can only do that if you've got bread locally. And I, I you know, and I, you don't do that in the media. You do that all behind closed doors. No, that's right. And you argue the case, you know, strongly behind closed doors. I certainly do this in public. Uh, um, while understanding that in the end they are the elected government, they will decide. And you can shape it. Okay, that's, that's important, I think. So that's, I think, one of the best attributes. Also being a great representative of your country, I think is terribly important. And there are some great women and men that I can think of in that context. Oh, I, I just should say in passing, I will never forget, I was in, uh, at a political exchange tour in Thailand in 1989, so before, long before I was in Parliament with a other group of young Turks um, sort of um, uh, with us there from all political parties. And the third secretary was looking after us. That was our level of importance. Um, I might add, but I remember seeing there were some peeps from Australian expats there, and some in, in in Bangkok, and some of them took no interest in local culture. And I thought, well, you will never ever fly in any country if you do not want to enjoy the culture of the place you're in and say, isn't this a privilege and a pleasure of being there? I mean, I really find that really challenging when people don't want to experience a different culture. Yeah, and you inspire me to give another answer to your question. I mean, I was terribly proud of the batch of generally young diplomats that I had at the High Commission in Port Moresby. It was a heady time. We had the most ridiculous crisis to deal with, which I'm happy to talk about if, you, if, if we get to it. But, but the point is, you, know, had the, you had these young people on their first postings, and I'm thinking particularly of the young women, who would walk in with very little experience, but would use their skill sets, start to engage with quite you know, senior, sometimes quite frightening, uh, beginning in politicians and develop relationships, um, develop important sources and advocate for Australia. But the reason that they were able to play these kinds of roles is that they had the courage to get out beyond the barricades, get, get out beyond the gates and live in the country. And, you know, as a, as a High Commission, I was strongly encouraging them that. I didn't want, there were some, you know, there's another character, type of character who wants to be the only person to engage as the head of mission. Mm. You've got to get your own people, get all your people out there because you're much stronger if that's the case. And I loved the way they did that. And some of them showed amazing courage at a very difficult period for us. Okay, question time. Who else has got some questions? Graham. Uh, Ian, thank you very much for your discussion tonight. Um, you talked about the, uh, the strength uh, that national staff can uh, bring to the effectiveness of embassies or high commissions. Um, are there aspects that, of the way that Australia uses national staff uh, that is different from the way that other countries might use national staffs? And are, are there ways that we might use them better? I, I, I think it probably varies across the system and depends a little bit on personality and context and all those sorts of things. I think we're pretty good at, at the way we work with local staff. I, I do remember that there could be some frustration on the part of local staff who felt that they could contribute but weren't really being consulted in some of the missions that I was in as a more junior person. Um, so, you know, it's not always perfect. But um, I, I actually think that we do a pretty good job of it. And I'm now in a position where people heading off as head of mission, some of them, not all of them, ask me for my, you know, ask me for my tips. And one of them is meet the local staff association or the local staff representatives as the first thing you do within within the mission. Because it may the meeting may not amount to all that much. But boy, will I remember that that's, that that's what you did. It's a, it's, it's, it's a brilliant way of getting, getting loyalty and understanding their perspective. Yeah, there might be you know, some more senior diplomats who feel a bit sniffy about that, but who cares? In the end, uh, it's an area to emphasize. And listening to them and understanding through them a bit better the local context is terribly important in my view. David? Yes. Funding for DFAT has been sort of wound down and fallen a little behind in the last sort of 20 years or so. Did this affect you in your diplomatic career and is it affecting 
Schrader's voice in the world in any way? I'm not sure it affected me. I was I was uh, fortunate to I had a particular career where I, you know, my two big head of mission roles were at big missions, which yeah. are pretty well resourced, and Morsley very well resourced, and so it should be and always has been. Uh, the um, struggle sometimes in Europe, but the but I know where the strain is, and the mm -hmm. strain is in smaller missions. Missions, it actually is almost well, not only almost it's an occupational hazard to try and run a, an embassy with only two Australia-based staff, um, particularly in an isolated location. Right. I mean, you know, Kiribati, for example, or two two Bali, the tiny missions, and when one goes on leave, the other one's effectively on their own. It can be terribly isolating, um, uh, and you need to be careful about that. I actually think that you're right. Resourcing for DFAT has basically stagnated, not for the development um, programs. I mean, that's grown okay, but the um, that it has stagnated, and where the investment needs to be now is in diplomatic capability outside Australia. We don't need more people in Canberra, we need more people at posts. And this is a big moment. We've just decided to spend 360 billion on nuclear submarines. Let's yeah. let not this be another moment like September 11th, which saw the defense and intelligence agencies mushroom in, in growth mm. in big fat sense here. Thanks. We've got, we've got a whole lot of young men in suits here, so yeah. either about the federal police here. <laughs> some budding young diplomats. Uh, so hi, hi, hi. Yeah, thank you for coming. My, my name's Alex. Um, I have a very specific question about the role of an ambassador and in a very specific situation. And just for personal knowledge, I have, uh, I have Russian heritage. And I've kind of felt like I've had both the uh, foot in both cultures uh, and I'd like to explore that further. Place to be right yeah. Now. Uh, I just I was hoping if you could provide some insight on the what must be going through the ambassador's head to the Australian ambassador to Russia's head at the moment. What kind of role would they have? Um, just what, what what do you think about um, about that role? Well, it's, again, answer Graham's question in the same in the same breath because th there's an example of an embassy that has been left too small. Um, so I, I I think that there's only six A based in in Moscow. Um, uh, and that's far too small. Um, uh, it constrains us, you know, if you want to seek out Russian diplomats, <laughs> I've got much left at home uh, if, they, if they decide to retaliate. I think it's a very difficult environment to work in and there are real constraints on, on your ability to have um, meaningful conversation and some of the conversations that you have to have given the, you know, very tense uh, uh, bilateral situation means you're putting yourself in a difficult situation very often. And I think I think it would be very hard. Um, I, I think Moscow's been a difficult place for some time. But I expected the, his counterpart, the Russian ambassador in Canberra, not always having an easy time either. Most amazing building of the, uh, of the uh, embassy in uh, uh, the Australian embassy in Moscow. In Moscow. Moscow. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Ebbett's time, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not that it was an ambassador, but when it was foreign affairs minister. Some questions online, and so it would be great to have some from uh, females. Uh, I've got two. One from uh, Blackshaw, uh, who's joined us online. He says, when stationed overseas, how important are ambassador slash high commissioner functions in getting things done locally and for the home country? Do, you think, do, do we mean actual functions as in I guess, yeah, uh, events? Um, yeah, uh, as in, I guess... Or the role. Uh, perhaps, yeah, how their role impacts sort of okay. more local um, and regional areas. So it's, it's not like, everything. I, I think, I think you know, any any sensible diplomat un understands that in, in many big na international relationships, it doesn't all go through the embassy. You know, when I was ambassador in Berlin, uh, you know, all the significant trade and investment between our two countries did not pass through my office. Um, it, you know, it, there's a relationship there that is natural and works well between, but between the economies. It's about finding your place in that and understanding where you need to focus and emphasise and 
by way of example, in the Berlin case, I spent a lot of my time on the joint response to the global financial crisis, which coincided mm. with my time there. We've worked a lot together on our joint um, uh, deployments in the north and south of Afghanistan, Germany and, and, and Australia, and on directing German finance toward the Asia Pacific region. Um, you know, so it's about selecting and thinking about. You get guidance on this. You get guidance in a letter from the foreign minister. Um, but you know, it's about selecting where you're going to focus. So it's important in that sense, but not for the whole thing. I, I just just hold. We've got another question. I just want to ask you this one. Um, and you talk about this a fair bit in your book. Um, uh, you know, when you're a consul you know, on the consul side of things, but no doubt as an ambassador as well. You can't blow all of your capital on one issue because then you're finished. So you've got to pick the fights and you've got to pick how far you can go in a fight. You know, say, you know, if you're giving consular assistance to someone, um, you'll end up completely blowing your contacts if you burn people or the like. Can you give a bit of an example of that or how you make sure that you, you, know, that you can continue to operate, not blow it all, blow it all in one? I was wondering if I'm safe to tell this story. Um, the uh, look as ambassador in Berlin, uh, I um, took a call at ten thirty at night one um, Sunday night, roughly ten thirty. Luckily, I was, I was in bed. Um, uh, I hadn't got to sleep though, and I was told that the prime minister back in Canberra wanted to speak to the chancellor. And I said, sure, we can arrange that in probably tomorrow. Well, you know, subject to Chancellor Merkel's availability. And the response was, no, you don't understand. <laughs> right, this was the speaker of the chair. I mean, no price is paid for who, who it was. <laughs> and I, and I, and I, I thought, okay, I know they need to appear to try here, but there is absolutely no way. That I'm going to burn my relationships on this because you know I, I, I knew the person I was speaking to, and I said, "Has war been declared?" No, 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 and I said, "Yeah, okay." And I said, "Give me a minute." I just put the phone down, and my wife saying, "What's going on?" I said, "I was just going to go and make a cup of tea." I went and made a cup of tea. Went back and and I, I rang back and I said, "Sorry, she's gone to bed." <laughs> and that was that was my way of dealing with it because no way I was going to burn my capital with. You know, the very senior person who worked directly to the Chancellor as her foreign policy advisor by ringing at 10 30 at night. So that's a, 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 a And I think that it's a really important point that you have to have that ongoing relationship, don't you, when you're a diplomat? It is not one that it would be very, very rare that it would be one game. Our next question online. Uh, I have a question here from Fran Humphreys. She asks uh, You mentioned the graduate pathway for relatively young people. But are there more non-traditional pathways for people who have had one or two careers before? Or is it too late for people in their 40s and 50s? We, we certainly generally know there's some for ex-federal politicians. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, look, there are, and there are more pathways now, I think, than there used to be. The, um, there, there is more lateral movement um, between, certainly between other government agencies and, and DFAT. Uh, and you know, the, the way DFAT manages human resources goes through fads and fashions. And at the moment, it's a fairly free market approach within the organisation in the sense that divisions of the organisation actually are freer than they used to be to go out and do a deal with someone and bring them in, subject to them, you know, meeting certain requirements and going through all the security uh, processes. Uh, so there's, a, there's, there's a, a fair bit more than that, more of that now. You make a, a reference to, you know, appointing ambassadors. Frankly, both sides of government have been appointed um, mm. ambassadors from the political class for some time now. Uh, the form, the last lot did it a bit more than most. Um, uh, there are certain missions that tend almost always, not always, but almost always, to go to a politician and Washington and London are the, are the most common two. Um, but we've got politicians in a few other places. Now. It's, I think, anyone would like that back to you. Have you ever been called in and given uh, 
you've been addressing down in the foreign affairs ministry of a of I have, country. I oh. have. I don't know, I don't tell, us, tell us how. Tell us what, what, what's the you know, well, you also, tell us what was about, but tell, tell us how, and how does that happen? Uh, yeah, I, I've had it happen to me, and I've also done it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the the, the uh, and more you know, sorrow than an anger. Uh, it, it, uh, I'm thinking about the the events. You know, it was usually it's in anger. Yeah, and, and but but it's in controlled anger. I mean, it's a it's a it's a diplomatic tradition. You summon the ambassador, and it's always hilarious to hear the EAs talking to each other right. uh, because you know the, the the EA to the ambassador usually doesn't quite understand the rules and says, "Oh, I'll have to consult the uh, the calendar." And the message goes back, "No, no, no, <laughs> you, you don't understand. You're coming in at eleven a.m. and whatever you're doing gets cancelled." I mean, that's the that's that's the way a summons works, and. Uh, the, uh, the head of mission, as soon as he hears the message, knows the score and knows to come in straight away. And it's, it's, it's a form of symbolic redress between governments, right? I mean, there's a whole spectrum of these things in sanctions at, one, at, at, at the top of the, recall, at the top of the list, recalling for consultation, recalling entirely. Um, calling, a, calling a head of mission in um, is fairly low on the... So I think the, the, the French ambassador over the submarine cancellation got recalled back to Paris. Was yeah, that the yeah. Oh, no, that's right. And every now and again, an ambassador can get expelled. I mean, I, in my observation, being declared persona non grata, that's the term, uh, um, it's usually pretty good for your career. I can think of two people off the top of my head who were effectively kicked out of, of, of the country. One was John Douth, who was expelled from New Caledonia in the 80s. He ended up as High Commissioner in London. And, uh, and, and and James Batley, who was expelled from Fiji in one of the Rambuka coups, and he ended up as a Deputy Director General of AusAid. So, you know, not necessarily a bad thing in your life. But you do get expelled not over what you've done, it's over what the government's done. So I pre presume if you get expelled over what you've done, then that's a bit more problematic. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, the judgment can be by the local authority that the ambassador tried a bit too hard. To, to, to exercise his functions. Usually it's a good way of getting credit on it. Uh, we've got a couple of, couple of quick questions. So if some, anyone, uh, anyone else in the audience got some questions? Yes. Just a quick one. Where does the military attaché fit, fit into this? Yeah, not every embassy or high commission has one, but, but many do. And uh, it's, that's about um, you know, maintaining a military to military relationship. Uh, and so, you know, obviously in Papua New Guinea, I had a very significant defence contingent. The defence advisor is another little convention. It's called Defence Advisor of a High Commission and Defence Attaché in an embassy, but it's, it may be of interest to you. I don't know it's of interest to others. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, in Port Moresby, you know, I had a colonel level uh, defence advisor and a very substantial contingent below him. Uh, in Berlin, I had a, I had a colonel as well. Um, uh, you know, they're more senior people. A major general gets posted as defence attaché to Washington and Jakarta too, I think. And generally, you have a few brigadiers sprayed around the, the, the larger missions. It's all about that relationship. And this is the thing, as an ambassador, one thing I was always very clear of, clear about is, and I was very clear to the people who worked in my mission, as the ambassador, you're not the senior DFAT person present, you're the representative of the whole of the Australian government. So the, the intel chiefs, and if you have them, not every mission has them, uh, uh, the defence, um, head of defence personnel, in my day, the head of OZA, uh, perhaps as a treasury representative, there's people from other departments. Locally, they answer to you, and you're you're not just the head of DFAT. I used to say the head of DFAT in this in this mission is that person, my deputy. Um, don't think of me as a DFAT officer because when you're head of mission, that's not what you are. And I think some of those military attaché roles too are about sort of clarifying, you know, going explaining what's happening with August, so your friends are not surprised. Last question down the back there. Um, this might be a big last question, but just zooming right out and thinking about diplomacy more generally, not in regard to Australia, but in the sort of wider machinations between all nations. And 
how do you feel that role plays in easing tensions and making the world, you know, not joking, a more pe peaceful place rather than ratcheting up towards conflict of some description? Look, I think it's the, the no time more so than the present where this role is crucial. Yeah. And this is why I think it really is going to be important um, that in the coming May budget, the government do something about the capability of the league. Uh, um, I'm not interested in seeing more aid money, frankly. I'm interested in seeing more capability. Um, it's not just about smoothing the way and smooth talking. It's it's about making sure that all sides have clear a clear understanding. Because a clear understanding helps you avoid mistakes. And if your diplomats are not caught up in the scheme of the, in the in the in the in the emotion of the moment and are able to give you hard headed reasoned analysis of what's going on, that could be an enormous help. Well, thanks, uh, well, thanks very much, Ian. Can I commend to you, and uh, we will circulate, we've got a special discount code too, uh, uh, Ian's book, Consulate. It, it talks uh, more broadly about the, that consular function and how it is locally, but in particular, uh, uh, your, uh, uh, your crisis group that, uh, that, uh, that you have there, uh, the Bali bombings, uh, some of the Danes <laughs> family, um, some of the uh, really, really interesting behind the scenes work uh, that is done. Uh, I found it very instructive, uh, the 9 11 and Bali bombing uh, work, because people have this tremendous need, of course, for knowledge about whether their family are involved, how they're going, what treatment's happening. And it doesn't just happen, and it has to happen in a really ordered way. And uh, we don't have time to talk about that tonight, but it's very, very interesting um, in the book. The messy but yeah. fun side of the business. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Ian. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, we'll ask the audience to thank you as well.